over the past decade, Lori David has worked to bring the issue of climate change into mainstream popular culture. She produced the 2006 Academy Award winning An Inconvenient Truth, a documentary film based on former Vice President Al Gore's 30 years of research on global warming. She was also the executive producer of the documentary Too Hot Not to Handle on the effects of climate change in the United States. In the spring of 2007, Lori launched the Stop Global Warming College Tour with Sheryl Crow. Lori has spearheaded numerous public education and action campaigns urging Congress and automakers to raise fuel efficiency standards and make higher mileage cars. Most recently, she's turned her attention from the environment to our children's emotional and physical health. Every issue we care about, Lori says, crosses the dinner plate. Her newest book, The Family Dinner, Great Ways to Connect with Your Kids One Meal at a Time, is an inspiring and practical guide to the most important hour in a family's day, dinner time. Please help me give a huge Connecting for Change welcome to Lori David. How is everybody? Sounds like you've had a couple of great days here. So I'm very grateful to be here and I want to thank Patty Sullivan for inviting me. And as he said, many of you may know me as a global warming activist, and it actually might surprise you that I'm now the author of a cookbook and talking about the importance of family dinner. And at first glance, I, I, think, I thought that was an odd transition too. But uh, there are other things headed for extinction besides the glaciers, and family togetherness is one of them. Overwhelming schedules and our current lifestyle are chipping away at family life. Now we may live under one roof, but we are often leading separate lives in separate rooms, on separate computers, watching separate televisions, and eating separate meals. Does that sound familiar? When sleeping is the only activity we're all doing together, the hope for connected family time is in serious trouble. And as a result, we are tossing away so much of what is rich from our daily rituals. And top of that list is family dinner. Now this time-honored tradition, and I'm talking about the real kind, so let's be honest here, where we sit down together and eat together and talk, is so important that it's one of the most powerful solutions to three of the biggest problems we face today. Our national health crisis, our increasing difficulty connecting with each other through the fog of technology, and our urgent need to take better care of the environment. Now, let me make my case by telling you about my very own Oprah moment. I'm the mother of two teenage girls. And if you've gone through that yourselves, well, then you know what a loaded statement that is, and I do accept your condolences. Thank you. <laughs> and like any parent, hardly a day goes by where I don't feel completely challenged or second-guess myself. And this made it all the more exciting the night I had my gigantic epiphany and realized I had done something right as a parent. Now, it was an ordinary school night, and I was sitting at the kitchen table, and dessert was long since over, when I realized that both my daughters were still sitting there, and they were talking to me. <laughs> this is big. Thank you. Now, this wasn't an isolated incident. In fact, this is pretty much what we've been doing almost five nights a week for over a decade. 
But that night, the enormity and the power of it struck me. That the ritual of regular family dinners was truly transforming. And I can credit it with a whole host of rewards, including turning picky toddlers into good eaters and all the social skills that come along with that, and providing regular ritualized access to each other. I can also credit the dinner table with helping us through a family crisis, and in my case, divorce, and even accomplishing the Herculean task, get this, of getting my ex back to the table with us. And if you want to read more about that, get my book. <laughs> so looking back now, as a more seasoned mom, I can confidently say that dinner has turned out to be the healthiest and most important activity my family did, bar none. Now, thank you. That's what I've learned from my own experience, but the scientific research on this topic is equally compelling. Dozens of universities have studied this, including Columbia and Harvard and Emory, and they've all reached the same conclusions. Basically, everything a parent worries about can be improved by the simple act of regularly sitting down and sharing a meal. I mean, just name your parental anxiety. Are you worried about drugs, alcohol, teen pregnancy, eating disorders, depression? According to the research, regular family meals lower all those risks. Are you concerned about your child's self-esteem or confidence or school grades? A 20-year survey of merit scholars had one thing in common without exception. They all came from families who ate together three or more nights a week. I mean, that's amazing. And if someone had told me back then that my Taco Tuesday ritual might mold a future merit scholar, I would have laughed. But it's true. Children who have regular meals with their parents do better in every aspect of life. Why? Because the dinner table provides the most effective place to share values, debate opinions, build vocabulary, learn manners, develop your palate, eat healthy home-cooked food, and pass on family history. One meal at a time, meal after meal after meal. Now the family history piece is really interesting, I think. The professors at Emory spent years studying this, and they concluded that the dinner table is the number one place that family stories are passed on to the next generation. And it's the knowledge of where grandma and grandpa came from and what they went through that builds resilience in kids. And guess what? When we stop sitting down to dinner, we stop passing on those stories. So why, as a society, are we letting this incredible tool for raising children slip through the cracks? Why are we shortchanging our families and ourselves by eating so many meals on the run, in the car, standing next to the counter, or in front of the television? I mean, an average meal today lasts about 18 minutes. I mean, talk about a low priority. Dinner is treated like a pit stop to pack in the protein. I mean, you know, we treat our cars a little better than that. In some ways, progress has set us back. And as we race forward and leave family dinner behind, we've had an explosion of health problems that were all but unheard of a few generations ago. That's not a coincidence. Today, diet-related illnesses are America's number one killer. Obesity is growing faster than any other preventable public health condition in the country's history. One in three American children are now considered overweight or obese. And of course, obesity triggers cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. And the stats on this are, are also frightening. The CDC recently reported that by mid-century, the number of people dealing with diabetes could also be one in three. I mean, that's a huge percentage of our population with a serious, chronic disease 
an expensive disease. And closely linked to the threat of obesity, and a little closer to home for me, and maybe some of you, is the huge and growing threat of digital overload. Okay, that's a fancy name for that sick feeling you have when you see your kid's face buried in a screen. A recent Kaiser Family Foundation study showed that children between eight and 18 are plugged into some kind of screen for an average of eight hours a day. And that doesn't include texting, which I, I mean, I can't even imagine what that stat would be. I think it's of particular note that in today, the, the front page of today's New York Times is about a school that is not allowing computers in the classroom. Okay, this is, but it's such a novelty, it's such a novelty that it's a front page article. So to put it another way, kids are spending half their waking hours staring at TVs, computers, phones, and MP3 players. And with numbers like that, it's not surprising that two-thirds of the kids in the study say their family turns the TV on during meals. Now, TV is a thief that robs everyone of a critical time to share daily triumphs and challenges and family stories. But it's not only antisocial, it's fattening too. It's estimated that kids unconsciously scarf down hundreds of extra calories when they're mesmerized by the television. And TV pummels kids with ads promoting junk food. One study calculated that kids see almost 8,000 ads a year, 70% of which are for things you would never want your kids eating. Another modern trend that's adding to our challenges is that more than half of our meals are now purchased outside of the home. This is an enormous lifestyle change with huge consequences. Because here's the truth. When you don't cook it yourself, you do not know what's in it. I mean, it's really true. You don't. What you can count on, though, is that it's higher in salt and fat and sugar. Okay, that you can count on. Fast food today makes up one third of everything we eat. A new study reports that kids are consuming over 200% more salt than the daily recommended serving. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're not doing that in your kitchen when you're making dinner. 10% of our kids' calories are coming from soda. And of course, we're eating way too much meat. A staple that used to be enjoyed a few times a week is now consumed sometimes three times a day. And it's not our grandparents' chicken either. The meat we're eating is full of antibiotics, hormones, and chemicals. And the vast majority of it comes directly to us from filthy factory farms where animals are force-fed food and medicines that are unnatural to their systems so that they can grow bigger faster to keep up with the growing demand. This is completely unsustainable for our health and for the health of the planet. Our love of pre perceived, thank you. Our love of perceived convenience is also a big part of the problem. The microwave, we all have them, right, is great for reheating, but let's face it, it has spawned a trillion dollar food culture of eat processed, eat fast, and eat alone. Processed pre-made food laden with chemicals and food dyes dominate our grocery stores. I mean, a simple salad dressing, which can be quickly made from scratch with three ingredients, is purchased pre-made at the supermarket with 19 ingredients, most of which you've never heard of before. Organics, thank goodness, are growing, but they are still only 4% of the overall market. To start tackling obesity and our other problems, we need to rewind, and here's some really good news. It doesn't require a government subsidy or the purchase of a new appliance. What we need is a reminder of where we came from and how the system used to work. Once upon a time, 
all food was organic. The majority of it was local. We cooked it from scratch. We even grew some of it ourselves. We ate fresh and in season. We waited until June for strawberries and corn knee high by the 4th of July. And our patience was rewarded with amazing taste, high nutrition, indelible food memories. Back then, we spent more time together enjoying it and we had fewer health problems. Back then, family dinner was a non-negotiable. I mean, if you didn't want to come to dinner, you better have a doctor's note. Back then, consciousness about what we ate and what we wasted and what we grew ourselves was an integral part of family life. Nothing was ever thrown out if it could be reused or repurposed. Back then, there was a greater connection with Mother Nature and respect for her gifts. Food didn't travel an average of 1,500 miles to the plate. And being green wasn't a marketing term. It was simply a part of the daily American experience. And the family dinner was at the core of this country's value system. And it needs to be at the core of the new food revolution that we are at the start of now. A revolution driven by choice. A revolution you are all a part of. We can choose to start growing some food ourselves, even if it's just a pot of herbs. We can choose to eat consciously in season. We can choose to cook food again ourselves so that we decide how much salt and chemicals we put into our body. And as much as we can, we can choose to source our food from local farmers who raise their animals sustainably and humanely. And if we choose to eat less of it, we can buy the better quality stuff when we do eat it. And we need to choose to sit down. Without screens, with whomever our loved ones are, and share in the sacredness of the moment and talk. This is how we set the table for a sustainable future. This is how we lead healthier lives with stronger family bonds, combat obesity and diabetes, and lower our carbon footprint. So whether your family includes kids or friends or coworkers, whether the meal is just soup and a salad or three courses and a homemade apple pie, this ritual will also help to make sure that life doesn't get away from you. Your family will improve, your family life will improve immeasurably because you'll know how much more everyone is feeling, what everyone is eating, and what everyone is thinking. This simple ritual is affordable, emotionally fulfilling, available to us every day, and will nourish us in ways no multivitamin can come close to. So let me close with a quote from a writer, Francine Duplusset Gray, who once said, dinner rituals have nothing to do with class or working women's busy lives or any particular family structure. I've had dinners of boiled potatoes with families in Siberia, suppers of deli cold cuts with single welfare mothers in Chicago, all made memorable by the grace with which they were offered and by the sight of youngsters learning through experience the art of human companionship. Simply put, dinner makes a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you.